When I buy the paint for that army, I don't just buy one part of it. I'll pick five or six of them. Really? Oh, no, no, no. This isn't even a joke. He's insane. <laughs> it's mad. I've done many big armies in my time, and I've found it utterly miserable. <laughs> it works quite well for an effective, quick tabletop army. It's the best tool for me for motivation. So I was just outside, and I was thinking, I need to start a new army, like to go on the, all the other armies I'm painting, all the other bits I'm painting on. I thought I'd do an orc army. I've got a bit of a bit of a bit of a tickle for, for an orc army. And who better than to get advice on painting 120 orcs than Ben from Warrior Workshop? <laughs> Hello. Thank Thanks you very on. much. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on. It's been we've we've wanted to get a team member on on the show for quite some time. Um, and Warrior's like the newest part of Siege. And um, and obviously I just thought it'd be really good to get you on and you you Willingly accepted a little, there was a little bit of convincing, but um, <laughs> I, will, uh, there wasn't, um, but, uh, well, there was, but yeah, um, a, a little bit of convincing to come on, but, um, but yeah, it, you, we're really good to have you on, obviously to chat about, obviously painting, uh, yeah. obviously warrior, loads of other bits and bobs, obviously then I just thought it'd be nice to have someone else from the company on to chat, chat about our favorite thing, which is obviously miniature painting. Yeah, no, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Do you want to do like a cliche, your little background on the hobby, how you got started yeah. and stuff, walk through your painting and then maybe yeah, can how do. you got into the warrior stuff? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I started around 2014 mm -hmm. um, at university. A uh, mate just said, do you want to try this Warhammer thing? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, uh, I know it from Dawn of War, like right orcs thing. ago. So, I mean, I always started with orcs anyway. So, so you were fully prepared for, yeah, for that job. Yeah, absolutely. Green skin connoisseur. And uh, yeah, so I just started there and then built up and up a bit. Um, moved into Blood Bowl at some point. And uh, that kind of became where I really started hobbying. And, um, and yeah, and then I started on taking little jobs and started painting for the warrior so nice it's been, it's been a good journey I, like, it's, it's interesting because blood bowl is a real I, I find blood bowl a really really good game like you've got have you it, played blood bowl i've played it a few times yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. just like real life football i'm crap at it so, <laughs> so i've um, never played blood bowl but i know it's like quite a culty game isn't it it's like one of the less oh, popular got, ones but the people who love it love i think it. it's got the biggest tournament fan base out of all games workshop games Really? Uh, yeah, like yeah. the World Cup last year had 2,400 people playing. It. I love that it's called the World Cup. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. What else would it be called? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've dabbled a little bit um, and this is a long, long, long time ago when I was actually in sixth form, we had uh, not, it wasn't like the Premier League or anything. There was about, only about seven teams. So it was always one person that played yeah. double matches or something. But but um, but yeah, we had, uh, we played bubble a fair bit in sixth form and, um, and I think I had an elf team back in the day. I think it was either elves or dark elves, one or the other. I can't They're remember. Were they all stood like this yes yeah yeah i don't know if that's elves or i think dogs. i think that's all of the teams but <laughs> that's, 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 that's the stereotypical pose for, for models back in it's either sword pointing yeah or, or hailing stuff, a cab or, as you call yeah, it hailing yeah. a cab or like arms on waist or like you know throwing the ball yeah yeah so so yeah no but um it was it was always fun but yeah that is that the good thing about those miniatures i think obviously with with painting as well is that they, they, each team is so varied like back in the day the models weren't as varied yeah um but some of the new since they relaunched it for i don't know how many times it's been launched now but since it's been relaunched all the teams now they're so varied and you get those tokens and icons as well don't you, you get like the, the the team is it like the icon or the token of the team and you get the yes yeah you get like the reroll tokens and the coins and stuff That's it. Yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot of variance in, in the miniatures which is great i think the best one was the halfling was it the halfling one that came out recently i think I'm sure uh, they had gnomes recently uh, is that what, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're very amazing. similar. They're both short, so, so yeah. <laughs> I think there's some of the best models they make. I yeah, they're really I, good. I they're brilliant. So yeah, but um, but what's your favorite? Like, for, for what's your favorite thing about painting those? Because you painted quite a lot of those, haven't you? Yeah, I think it's just the fact that it's kind of like kill teams and um, like some Necromunda kind of thing, where you sort of get a bit of a taste, mm -hmm. and it's not you're not fully committing, which we'll, we'll come into in a bit. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like a whole army. Um, but it's quite nice to sort of get a new experience every time, mm -hmm. and it's a really cool game. Like I like getting into it because. Um, you can, you can experience a different game with each team. So like you can rock up to a game with minimal investment, play your team, and then you can go next week with a completely different one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really cost you much. Oh, right. You want to do a whole new game. And yeah. I think that's really interesting. It's funny because Kill Team has kind of become the default like skirmish game when everyone yes. always says like, oh, if you want to just practice like painting some smaller forces and have some variety instead of doing an army, do a Kill Team. But then like Joe spoke about Underworlds, which didn't really get a look in for me until Joe mentioned it. And then you've mentioned Blood Bowl. And like thinking about it now, and Necromunda, etc. It's like there's actually like way more skirmish games. Yeah, way. that's cool. Um, so that's nice. You don't really think of whenever someone says like, "I'll oh, paint like a skirmish force" because you get like a lot of flavor and you can change and you can do them quite quick. I don't think Blood Bowl is one that you hear mentioned too. No, often. it's more board game than skirmish yeah. game as well. It's 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 different vibe. I think it doesn't really feel like a games workshop game. Really? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've never played Blood Bowl. I've always been intrigued by it. Yeah. Because um, like I said, it's got like quite hardcore 
that yeah. place. But <laughs> why do you why do you think it doesn't have it doesn't feel so much like a GW game? What 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 is it about? Is it because it's a more of a sport based game? Well, I say sport, they still punch living hell out of each other. Yeah, that's true. But is it because it is that more of a sport sport I'm, sort of I'm, game? I don't really know. I think it's a pure vibes thing. Okay. I think it's I, I couldn't really tell you what it is, but I just feel it's it's got um. It's just it's just the sort of the way they they approach it, and it's also because it's really like old world focused, where yeah, yeah. nothing really is anymore, or yeah. not obviously except the old world. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's just, well, that's a recent thing, though. To be fair, isn't it? It's true. Yeah, been getting modern support for much much longer than yeah. old world has. So, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're saying about it being a board game as well. I mean, I, I I've, I've often whenever I've gone down Bugman's or I've gone down like I've seen people playing it in, in there. So it's very much more. It's I think it's more seen as like a like a pub game. Yeah, it's chess with dice. Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, but um, on the flip side of that, I've also seen people that have created, they've basically made a scenery stadium for it before as well. So you have like all oh, yeah. seats and all that kind of I'm stuff. I'm just imagining well. like a Sabutio style, like Blood Bowl yeah. table. People go all out, man. At tournaments, <laughs> yeah. people enter painting competitions with huge dioramas, castles and things. Yeah, that's it's mad. Whoever models the Mexican wave. Like, <laughs> like, 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 can you imagine modeling the Mexican wave? That'd be amazing. Yeah, no. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I had fun while I was playing it, but I said it was, it was, I, I, well over a decade or so ago yeah. but I think it's longer than that probably probably need two decades but do you but, think the fact that it's like loosely sport based puts more people off than draws people in it put me off I only played it because all my all, like all of my local club were playing it that's the only reason I played it I was just like I don't want to touch this game it's sports I don't like sports because yeah. Yeah. I then, feel like not to stereotype but I feel like the overlap <laughs> of sports fans and Warhammer fans like a lot of people get into Warhammer because they're not into sports oh man you'd be you surprised I mean? like, a lot of these Blood Bowl players are massive NFL fans as well so. oh I'm sure they are yeah. don't get me wrong but I just feel like the overlap is maybe smaller than it might be I, I was going to say like NFL is probably the closest real life sport to Blood Bowl this, yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, not uh, far off yeah I mean rugby's Pretty close, I'd imagine, but but yeah, maybe ice hockey, maybe ice hockey. Yeah. <laughs> the amount of fighting that's in it, yeah, but um, but yeah, no. So it's so more more about the mm. painting side, obviously. So tell us, so obviously, a bit more about like what what some of your favorite things to paint. What 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 is it you enjoy about miniature painting? What are the things for you that you enjoy about it? Um, so yeah, as I said before, orcs have been like such a love for me. I've I really like them because you get a taste of everything, mm. and you can be a little like quite liberal with how you paint them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm kind of usually stereo like historically a bit of a grubbier paint style like grimdark stuff and having orcs really led into that so i could do all these ramshackle vehicles like my army's evil sons so i've got all of the vehicles all the buggies all the bikes it's grimy as hell it's fine by me it's got rhythm in it so. yeah exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and and then but then you've got like the green skin and you've got all these like flesh tones which you can experiment with and you've got all these um it's just those are different textures in an army which i think is really fun mm, no, you just don't have to be neat so i think it's really new player friendly so. yeah no definitely I, that's one of the things that or i think orcs are a very good entry point into warhammer because i think sometimes perhaps when you do look at box art stuff uh and you look at marines or you look at maybe some other like tau and stuff mm -hmm. like that it can look quite quite menacing as, a, as an yeah, objective really to execute. Pristine. Yeah, 100%. And, and I think that's one of the things I've always loved about Orcs is that you, you not only, I think for multiple reasons, not just the painting, which we, I know we're sticking on predominantly at the moment, but and I'll get into the other bit in a sec, but for painting, the, the whole thing, they've got different clans. So if you've got a favorite color, obviously you're still going to paint the skin tone, the color that it, it is as per the box art or as per obviously the law, whatever you want to do. I mean, we've spoken about different skin tones and before many of many or many of a podcast episode, but um, the fact that you can change that by obviously just doing goths or you could do bad, bad moons or you could do death skulls or you could do any of those things. I think it adds so much. They've got so much richness to them because of those individual clans. A marine chapter obviously has its heraldry and all that kind of stuff. But I think there's a lot more to orcs potentially because of the combination of how unique each one is. Yeah. And also at the same time, you've got the overlap of all the, all the individual clans that go with it as well. I think maybe we're in need of another faction that aesthetically is different to the orcs but is as friendly in that regard, if that makes sense. They did bring in Crew. Yeah, I feel like Crew so. kind of feel that, where they're like sort of more bestial. But I guess the issue with that is that they're attached to Tau perhaps I guess, too yeah. much, because then I think of Tau as being like complete on the other end of the spectrum, like we use them as a Yeah, yeah. But no, I, I think the other thing I was going to touch upon is obviously just the model, model inside of it, which is a huge part of it for a lot of people. Like every other faction has its designated units and things that it, that it should take. Whereas orcs, specifically, well, I say specifically, but more so with Death Skulls maybe than any other other uh, clan, you can literally loot any oh, yeah. any tank or any vehicle <laughs> and and just make it work. And when you put it on the table, you go, well, that's a battle wagon. And people go, oh, yeah, it's orcs. Yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. this absolute monstrosity I made about a year into the hobby with a friend's Land Raider he didn't want anymore. And I just had like a land, this, this Chaos Land Raider 
with what was remaining of my um, what's the plane? Dakajet. Dakajet. Dakajet sprue. And it looks horrific. <laughs> I, put, like, I put everything on that. And it, I look at it now and it's like badly spray painted, maybe a dry brush. And I'm just like, well, that's, <laughs> that's not, there's looting and there's, there's just messing up a model. <laughs> Definitely 100%. I think, I think that's one of the interesting things to me is that I think from, not only from painting, but just as a project, like you can do so much to it and add such a unique flair to it. Like when you, when you maybe other factions that are in 40k, uh, like you have to be quite linear towards obviously how they are as a faction or the characters or the I think or just the units that are in there, and that's one of the things I think for me that is a, is a favourite of of orcs is that you can you can do that with it. So obviously speed freaks are your your army. Yeah. For what sure. is it about? What is it about them apart from painting red, which is arguably the best colour? Uh, what 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 is it that about them that you that you like? They were just fun. Okay. Like it was, it started off a paint. Well, I, my, my favorite models to paint were killer cans. So, I mean, it's like the, the painting side like was, was separate, but yeah, they, they, the speed freaks lent in from the gameplay. I just loved having, I loved how it looked. Yeah. Having like 18 bikers and then just, just zooming up and then let your opponent deal with it. I, I think we've got a secret, um, secret competitive player. It's that extra inch of movement because yeah. he's, got red, he's got a red paint job. That, that, oh, they that got can. rid of that, didn't they? I, know, I, was, I, was I was so curious. gutted. <laughs> yeah, it's so gutted when they got rid of that. Um, so yeah, but no, um, so, so obviously you, you joined us yeah. at, joined us at Warrior. Um, it was Warrior launched uh, over a year or so ago and uh, and obviously it's grown as a, as a brand in the business. How did, how, like your painting, obviously you, you said you mentioned painting, you prefer painting in more of a grimdark style. How did you, how did you find obviously painting more in the, in the way that we do at Warrior? How, how did you find like, changing your painting or did, how did you find adapting to the way that we, we kind of like paint for, on that side of the brand? Uh, well, I got an airbrush quite a while back. Yeah. And I think um, that really helped do large scale projects. Mm -hmm. And um, so I really let into it a lot. I spent a lot of time learning it. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to do everything it could do. And um, so I've, I've finished up a couple of projects. I think it was an Ogre Force I did mm -hmm. for Age of Sigma that uh, I really heavily used the airbrush to like get skin tones yeah, really yeah. clean and really varied. And um, that then, I think when I saw the warrior stuff you're being posted, you're recruiting for it, I'm just like, well, that's kind of similar to what I've been doing with this. And then I had like some Necrons, which was all quite airbrushed. I mean, Limited you can get out of metallic with an airbrush, yeah. but it's. Uh, <laughs> I think still can. I think for metallics, I think I don't know if you use it or not, but like one of my favourites is the um, the Vallejo metal colour. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah, yeah. the uh, burnt iron. I yeah, think it is yeah. undercoat with an aluminium on the top. Yeah, There's like a zenith almost. Yeah, yeah, it actually yeah. looks really good. So. Yeah, it's I, 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 it's like it's like metallic silk. That, yeah, that goes, that goes on with the airbrush. And when you brush it on as well, it, it still brushes on really. It's well. amazing it's, with a paintbrush. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. With the I mix brush. it in actually a little bit. Oh, it's probably just giving away a hobby. Hat, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I need to save these. It's, it's all right. you, you keep throwing them in. That's not a problem. Not a problem at all. Um, so yeah, no, but um, but that's really interesting because like um, it, uh, I, we always have questions about airbrushes and stuff. So to hear your perspective on that and how you mm. how you used it. What do you think? One of the one of the real like important things when you first got it and started using it. What was one of the things that you like? For your style of painting at the time, what 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 improvement did that aid you with? It? How did you speed. find just speed? Just speed. I think speed and clean blends. Yeah. I mean, you can. I mean, you do sit there for hours blending capes and things, and uh, and armor and glazing and getting really really smooth transitions. And I think you can get quite not nearly as clean and refined or controlled, um, but you can get pretty much there with a smooth blend with an airbrush. Um, if you take the time to sort of, sorry, <laughs> if you take the time to sort of, uh, like, be accurate with it and like learn the pressure control and things like that, and it is just it's just a speed thing. Like, for, I like painting to tabletop standard. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like Warrior, right? It's like a tabletop alternative. Yep. Um, and I think it just does that really, really smoothly and effortlessly, almost. Yeah. No. Perfect. Do you, know, do you know? I've just realised, kind of ironically, I didn't really think about this before. When I joined the Siege team. I was painting in a very, very airbrushed style, but Warrior didn't exist yeah. at the time. And I had to change my painting style to the Siege format. Yeah. So you kind of got like a Double. bit of a, a reverse situation going I on. I suppose there. so, yeah. yeah. It's a little, a little bit of reverse. Oh, yeah, because Warrior, you're quite right. Warrior wasn't around at the time. I, I think in hindsight, I probably would have naturally transitioned to doing the Warrior stuff, I would think. If, yeah. uh, if Warrior had been around at the time, that probably would have been... Where I started, I would have thought. What I, made you move? Sorry, what made you move away from the airbrush? Uh, I mean, other than just doing the siege. Well, I, I'd always loved the box art style, but it always felt a little bit out of my grasp. And then once starting working for Siege, I 
immediately was like, okay, I've got to sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming to, I've, I spoke about this on the first episode of this podcast, but um, I'd been commission painting for a little while and I was starting to move into the box art style anyway. Um, and then when I came for my siege interview, I saw an, inc like an incredible amount of miniatures, first of all, which were all painted in the box art style that Siege is known for. And I saw one model in particular, which was painted by Matt Kennedy. And uh, it was this Space Marine captain that had been painted uh, like in a Harry Potter Slytherin color scheme. And it is the, to this day, I, I don't know if it's just because of like some sort of nostalgia for that moment, but that is one of the cleanest, like most creative paint jobs I've ever seen in my life. And I literally walked away from that day and she went, nah, I'm painting like that. I'm going to paint like that. You went, and, you, if memory serves correct, you went home, bought the exact same captain and, and done your own version of it because you loved it so much. James, I barely walked to the car and I was ordering the right <laughs> <my phone. laughs> Yeah, no, fair. I mean, that's dedication, to be perfectly honest. That is. But I do, I do love the airbrush style. Like, I think it's his own thing. I don't it, even think it of is. it as like, I don't even think of them as um, like detracting from each other. No, I agree. I, I think of it as like its, its own camp and its own style and its own aesthetic. And I think that it gets, uh, there's a stigma around it that it's easy. Yeah, or like a crush. Or that or... it's like the cheap, quick way to do it, which I don't think is actually true. I think it's just a stylistically different thing. I agree completely. Yeah, and that's why I say you like, you, you can usually tell if something's been airbrushed. Yeah. I think it's got a look to it. And, it, but I think it, it works quite well for an effective, quick tabletop army mm. really well. Yeah. Um, it, it's got a very, like the airbrush has got a very clinical kind of look. Like I would, even, even when you do things like, for example, like blended swords, et cetera, like the, the one that's airbrushed, it's, it, the, the fact that it is so seamless because of the transition that it creates, a seamless brush blended blade, it still has this almost like natural yeah. marble kind yeah. of, like, do you know what I mean? I don't know how to explain it in the best yeah. way possible, but no, you, can, exactly right. you can visibly see like they'll both be as uh, like factually as smooth a transition as each other. It's but, hard to be as subtle. Like even if you're the most controlled person with the airbrush in the world and you've got an amazing, very, very expensive airbrush and you've got years and years of experience, at the end of the day, usually 99 times out of 100, there is going to be more depth with a brush and you're going to have less pastel colors. Yeah. Typically, it's possible to do. But it's that thing, isn't it? It's like you can get 80% of the result for half the effort. Yeah. It's, and it's seen as that. But then people skip the skill bit where, okay, well, to make it look good, you've still got to know how to use the airbrush properly. Yeah, you've not just make splatter informed, everywhere. You've got to make informed <laughs> choices on what paints you're using to not make everything just look like super bright and pastel-y and like, yeah. So it's almost got like its own cartoony look to it when it's done mm. a bit a bit too dramatically. No, I agree. Yeah. yeah, I agree. After nearly 10 years of delivering premium miniature painting services, we here at Siege Studios have listened to your feedback. As such, we have developed an alternative and more affordable option to get your miniatures painted for battle with what we call Warrior Workshop. We've built a whole new team of painters from the ground up, dedicated entirely to completing tabletop level miniatures in a new high contrast volumetric painting style, perfect for gaming and tournament play. And best of all, with Warrior Workshop operating as part of Seed Studios, you'll receive the same level of quality assurance and customer experience that we are known for. To see the gallery, learn more and get a quote for your project now, head to siegestudios.co.uk or follow the link in the description of this episode. Okay, this is a new segment on the podcast, which we're calling Critique of the Week. Now, you might have noticed if you're subscribed to the channel on YouTube that me and James have started a new video series called Critique Clinic, which is where we give some feedback to our patrons and they submit us models that they would like to know how they can improve specific techniques and things like that. And we thought it'd be fun to uh, give some of our favorite ones from a, a recent episode a little shout out on the podcast. And I think semi-frequently we'll... Uh, We'll do these on the podcast, I think. We'll read yeah. one out. So in next week's episode, if you listen to this podcast when it comes out, you'll see us dive into this kit-bashed Raptors chapter, Phobos Lieutenant, painted by Sam, who's one of our patrons. And he asked us how we can create more contrast with color schemes that tactically blend into their environment, uh, as this one does with its jungle basics. So obviously, we've got like a green armored scheme. He's quite looking quite tactical. He wants to blend into his environment. He's trying to create some contrast and separation between like the green foliage. Uh, so if you'd like to hear our thoughts and tricks for that, uh, subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for that next week. And don't forget to check out the previous episodes on the channel too. And hopefully you can pick up some painting tips and learn how to critically view models so that you can improve your own. Uh, before, do you want to give anyone like a little sneak teaser of uh, some of your thoughts on that miniature, James? Yeah, I mean, I really liked it. I think uh, I've got a lot of experience painting camouflage with doing nearly, I think about 100 or so naked Rambos when I've done my cash Army. <laughs> um, but, um, but, uh, yeah, like obviously 
I think when we looked at the model, went over it. Obviously, the the foliage and everything on the base is is a little bit slightly darker than actually the miniature. The miniature is quite bright. Um, one of the things that I I thought about the model when I first saw it is when you think about films like, for example, like Predator, or you think of any film that's like even like Vietnam films or things like that. The camouflage or attire that they wear, like soldiers, tends to be darker and the reason for that is when they're in foliage it's typically in the shadows that that camouflage tends to help blend in the, the, the wearer into the environment um i think the only thing that would be different of that would be like an arctic environment where it's all super bright white and obviously the suit or the camouflage is bright white but within jungle uh, what i done with on my, my cash is just an example was I, I painted the majority of the actual materials i'd done that quite dark and then the basing was the flip of that the basing was the bright thing so it looks like they're moving through a bright jungle but then inherently themselves they are darker if that makes sense the one thing I, I thought about when i saw the model was that the armor is actually quite bright um and again we always give feedback i want to say this as a caveat feedback is always given from us in in critique clinic or when we're uh, on classes or anywhere that we obviously look at your models in hand or, or on photos we always do it in two bases we do factual and opinionated to separate the way of delivery so that you can digest those two things um but I thought my opinion on this is that I would personally have done the armor slightly darker so that I could pump the contrast up on the base and actually give that natural bright jungle environment for the model. And that was one of the things I think when we went through it and looked at the model that was kind of like my take from it. Fair. Ben, have you got any experience in sort of doing uh, any like tactical environment schemes with models or anything like uh, that? I've, I've done a couple of things. Um, something I like doing with um, with getting higher contrast in these situations is, and it's what the this painter has already done to an extent, is accentuating the fact that it's not just colors that contrast, it's textures. Mm. So making the the model, the, the base of the model, really organic and soft contrasts well with the sort of hard surface metallic chipping on the armor and things like that. And sometimes even those textures can contrast quite well. So even yeah. if the colors are blending, the contrast and textures really yeah. can help advice. stand out. Yeah. I've been really enjoying doing the, the critique clinic episodes. I don't know about you, James. It's quite fun to, it, it makes you, th- it's kind of like, it's like I, I feel like I get as much out of it learning to critique people's models because I can start applying that to my own models, if that makes sense. A hundred, hundred million percent, yeah. Like, and I think that's one of the important things. Whether, whether you know, you, you, you want... I think one of the things with feedback that a lot of people do get a bit worried about is that, is that, that someone's going to, like, you know, purely say... I've heard it all the time on classes when people like say, oh I, oh, I get feedback from my friends and they all just say, yeah, it's great or it's really good, etc. And they, a lot of people want critical feedback but delivered in a in a way where they can actually understand whether it's someone's opinion, as I mentioned, or if it's a factual statement, for example. And I think that's one of the things that I've enjoyed the most. It's just helping people to to, to separate the feedback into those two avenues so it makes it easier for them to understand. Yeah. I think that, that for me is is one of the ways that I've, I, I don't know, whenever I've, I've got feedback, I've, I've been there and had the torrent of information that's been given to me and not having it in that manner where it's separated into those two things, I think I just think it makes it easier for me to decide as a painter, well, that's do I want to do that because that's what they think or do I want to do that because that's actually on the model? Does that make yeah. sense? And I think that's that's kind of like one of my favorite things is helping people that are asking for advice or asking for some steering on it with that type of delivery. Do you think that, um, obviously, it's a bit difficult when you're doing your own models because you've got your own like biases in it and yeah. you kind of come blind to your own problems, but, but do you find that it's kind of changed how you say you're working on a model and you take a photo of it, do you think that it's changed how like you can kind of give yourself feedback? How is it changed how you look at your own stuff? It, it, it has to an extent. Yeah. Because, because like, whenever I look at stuff, I like, right. Okay. Uh, I, obviously the factual stuff, if I've, if I've missed something or if I've, you know, something's a little bit rough or maybe I've missed something or, you know, you always get that, that cheeky mold line that hides from you. Like, you know, yeah. like, you know, it <laughs> happens, it happens and you have to go back over and get it off. But, but like, I think it helps me because I'm, as, as I'm painting, I'm I'm almost like assessing it as if I would, as if I'm, not, I'm separating it into those two things. Like I could do the lenses this color, but factually based on color theory, this color would probably be better for the thing. But it still means if I choose this other color, yeah, doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong, you know. So I think it does, it does, it does help as well when you self-diagnose your own stuff while you're working. I think that's you know, I it's always, good to get another set of eyes on it, though, isn't it? Because I find that with my own stuff. Sometimes I find it hard to see the the forest from the trees because I'll take a photo of something and I'll zoom in and be like, oh, you missed this tiny little pathetic thing and I'll nitpick myself and then not realize like, hey, by the way, should you probably use a different color for that? Because like, yeah. I, we've done this with my um, with my Stangar veterans. I was uh, looking at my photos and I was like critiquing myself and like trying to find like little mistakes and stuff. And then me and James had a conversation about like, should you have done the tabards black? Do you know what I mean? It's like you, those are big picture decisions that you find you're, it's hard to see because yeah. you've already made a decision. You've already made yourself okay with it in the back of your head. You need another set of eyes to make decisions like that. I think, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that in this podcast episode. <laughs> I have validation for last week. So yeah, that's fine. 
yeah um but no yeah you're right yeah like i said that feedback is crucial for like as a painter like you know your friends are always going to say to you it looks great or it looks amazing because they number one they don't want to they don't want to say something horrible to you or not horrible that's not probably the right word yeah you don't want to hurt feelings do you? no no yeah. but like it, I, I hear it all the time oh yeah my friends say it's great etc but they, they don't they they will never tell you the friends are the people that will tell you it's great but they won't tell you the stuff because they don't want to come across the wrong way. And I get that. I, I don't even that. think it's necessarily that though, because I think you can show someone something and they're saying it's great because they do think it's great, but they're not necessarily um, equipped to look at a model critically in the same way that we would as professional painters, for example. No, totally. Yeah, no, um, totally. Which is like a blessing and a curse in a way, isn't it? I wish, <laughs> I wish that I could, sometimes I do wish like on myself that I could look at even my own stuff and just be like, oh, that's nice. It looks good. It objectively looks good. That is a miniature that you've painted. You've painted it well, but... Because I'm always like trying to push the envelope as much as possible. A lot of people can tell you it looks good, but not many people can tell you why. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I think, I think the thing that I'd advise anybody like, with with critique clinic and all the different things that we do, I, I, I just think personally for me, being your own worst enemy and being harsh on yourself and being honest with yourself, I think as long as you're those two things, I think your your painting will grow massively because you won't just settle for oh that's okay, that's acceptable, oh it doesn't look too bad. If there's that little niggle of, oh, it's not perfect. Yeah. I think if you keep in that kind of area, I think you're always going to push as a painter. Yeah, 100%. Uh, if you would like to submit a miniature for Critique Clinic, check the link in the description of this episode, become a patron, and then you'll have access to that uh, feature, I guess you'd call it. Is that a feature? feature yeah, club. Yeah. I don't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, topic for this week. We've been keeping you waiting long enough. Army painting. It's something that we've all struggled with, myself included. Motivation is a big issue with this, but also... You know, we really wanted to do a whole episode on the spectacle of an army painting, as I guess we've kind of coined, Peachy kind of coined the phrase on our, on our did, show. Yeah. But uh, we wanted to kind of go into more overall how we view army painting. And uh, we've, this is why we brought Ben on the show, to give his tips from painting some massive projects for Warrior Workshop, how he stays motivated, processes and how he approaches it, some hobby hacks and tricks and things like that. Um, I think motivation is probably where I'd like to start, actually, because mm -hmm. I found that I've done many big armies in my time. And I found it utterly miserable <laughs> every single time. Um, I did wonder if you brought me on for this podcast as like personal <laughs> reasons, because you're both there like, right, how are we going to be well, James Stark loves it. <laughs> James is like the most regimented painter I know. And you can sit him and say, hey, James, you want to pay, paint 120 brown belts for the next three days? And he'd be like, yeah, sign me up. But uh, yeah, I'm curious, like, what is everyone's thoughts on, on how I think motivation is easy to come by at the start of a project. You're very excited about it. You've got this new army. You want to try out these new colors. You've got these new paints. You've got this right, really great idea, some lore, whatever. And then you get them all built. And that was a slog, but don't worry. You'll get into the good bit. You'll get into the paint and you're finally there. You've got them all spray primed. You're like, okay, that took a bit longer than they needed. And I had a bit of problems with the spray can, but don't worry. We'll get into the painting now. Oh, I've got, I've got to block in all, all, of, all of the pouches. First one's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then, you know, I find that it, it really fizzles out. So I'm curious when you get to like the third leg of a project, like, You've got, you're really getting into the, the real chore of it. How do you like to stay motivated? How do you stay, do you stay motivated? James, do you want to start? Uh, so yeah, I, I, I personally enjoy painting big batches. I actually find it very rewarding and very uh, relaxing. So I, so I'm probably, I'm going to give it, uh, hopefully a lot of the things, uh, tips and things that I can give in this, in this main topic will, will be helpful. And, and obviously you, you guys have also got some awesome stuff to contribute as well. So I, I think for, for, for me, I think breaking the back on the project is, is really important and getting, once you get to that downhill slope, it becomes so much more fun because the, 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 the end spectacle um, is the thing that, helps you maintain speed as you come down the other side of the mountain, so to speak. I think the biggest bit of advice I could, I could give anybody is, I always say this in, whenever we talk on podcasts or episodes or whenever I speak to people about, about army painting or projects, is planning the project. And, and we don't, if you plan the project well enough, you don't necessarily need to do a test model. Um, and I think there's this big whole thing with like a test model and then like planning and et cetera. I think you, you can either have a hybrid of both of those things, uh, you know, or, or if you do plan the project well enough, you almost don't need to do the test because you, if you follow the steps that you put in the plan, you'll get the result. And I know you need to visualize it, et cetera. And I get, I can understand why a test model would need to be done. Um, I think that comes in the predisposition that you know exactly what you want to do with the model before you start. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I guess some people go like, I want to do orcs, not hundred percent on the colors yet. Let's do a test. Yeah. Oh, I think I want to do in blue. You paint more blue. And you're like, ah, yeah. Maybe I'll do in red. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think, I think one of the things though is, I mean, the way I look at it is, 
if I'm going to do a new army, my test model is reference online. Mm. So I, because if the way I look at it, again, I always say, bang on about it. Time is the most important commodity. Once it's gone, you don't get it back. You have to invest a considerable period of time building the test model, cleaning the test model, doing everything you can do on that army on that one model to visualize it and have it in physical form, which I understand for some people they need that. And again, this is, there isn't a single linear approach to painting armies or to get into the end objective. However, if you say to me, I'm going to give you eight hours to get on with the army, I'm going to give you eight hours to do the test model. I'm going to spend that eight hours on the, on the, on the army. And the reason, the way I get around that is by making sure that I, I've got folders and folders and folders on my, on my computer of different factions and photos of different color schemes or colorways or things that I like, that I've found when I've searched for Space Wolves or Dark Elder or this. I curate almost like a folder of the faction that has all these reference images of color schemes that I like, of like markings that I like, or like I've got a folder with some white scars in it and there's, some, there's a specific photo just off the top of my cuff where there's like some pack markings that I really like on that specific. They've got some jet bikes and they've done the pack markings in a certain way. So I'll curate loads of photos from just genuinely just searching. And we all do it. We all save stuff that we see on Instagram or screenshot or whatever the case may be. <laughs> My save bit on Instagram is a mess. I could do yeah. a tidy up yeah. in there. <laughs> so, 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 oh, that's cool. Save. <laughs> we, we've, we've got all these, all these, this reference all over the place. And like, that takes seconds to curate that or it takes half the time to curate it. So if let's just say hypothetically, I want to do an orange Necron army. I can go on Google Images and go orange Necrons and it will put up a load of orange Necrons and I can go, oh, I like the armor, the tone on that one. I just need to get colors. And I know obviously photos on the internet, you can have different color balance, et cetera. I know I understand that totally. But if you try and find a photo that you really like the look of and just try and paint that and get that, that's a way more efficient way of getting a test in my mind than just spending eight hours or however long just banging a test model out. And I don't think anybody would bang a test model out super quick to not to not the end result, if that makes sense. Um, purely because I am so time oriented when it comes orientated when it comes to actually painting miniatures, I would much rather do that, start have a really good foundation and plan of where I want the army or project to be. And then if I get down there and I go, actually, do you know what? I've done the gems on these Space Marines blue, but actually I think red would be better. At least the 90% is where I need it to be. And it's only at 5% or 10% that potentially I need to change, if that makes sense. I think there's a level with the test model, though, where you get a bigger return from the investment you spend on it. So if you're doing, like, for instance, those 120 orcs I did, yeah. they're all the same. Yeah. And I think being able to do the test model, if I had made one mistake, and that's a five-minute paint job on that model, yeah. that's 10 hours. Yeah, if yeah. I've done that across all the models, and at the end result, I'm thinking, no, I, I did that that's too late to make make decisions it's a huge that change investing. things like yeah, that yeah. but I, I, I do know what you're saying no I, I totally this is why it's so interesting because we've all painted big armies and we've all climbed over the Everest and got to the other side multiple times and the thing is is like it's really interesting how di all of us have different approaches to doing it and, and that's why I think that like it's a very personal thing when it comes to doing it, your way of doing it I'm still it. not sure on the right way to do it to be honest because I've done I've done test models and regret not necessarily regretted it but been like that wasn't really necessary and then I've also not done test models and wish I'd done them. And then equally, I've done test models and been like, thank God I did a test model because that's saved me a headache. And then, and the other way around as well, I've been like, oh, I didn't do a test model. That's good because it worked out fine first time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I, I totally I think it depends on how you're attacking the test model and why, because if you're doing it so that you can dial in your scheme, there's an objective there. But if you're doing it as like a procrastination project of like, Oh, I don't really fancy actually painting the whole army. I'd like to get this like dopamine hit of doing one model. Get the um, Instagram pics and then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think that's why I said to you, I said like, if there's an army idea you like, I've said this specifically to James because he's got a serious problem with buying miniatures, but uh, if there's a specific like idea for an army you like, paint one model to see if you would like the idea of doing the army or not and then go and buy your army because then you haven't made like a massive financial investment as well. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree totally. Like I, I'm a bit of a fringe case with the the, the backlog that I've got, um, but um, or, or the <laughs> amount of projects that I've got on. I'm, yeah, I get that totally. Um, Can how I just circle back a little bit? So the motivation <laughs> was, yeah. the, was the sort of question there. So when you are, you know, fair enough of what you've all said about the planning and stuff, and that's very, very useful. But when you're, you know, through all of that yeah. and you're deep into an army project, because I know that a lot of people listen to this podcast they're painting their army now, like while they're listening, right? What are some things that you have found keep you, like keep your spirits up? So actually with the, with the motivation, I, <laughs> it's a circle. 
back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, George. Um, the test model actually helps me because I have a different, um, a secondary approach to the test model where I time each step. And therefore, I can know if I'm doing 100 models and I'm doing green skin, I know how long that's going to take. Oh, that's interesting. That's I've not heard that before. Yeah, that is very interesting. And then yeah. that's a goal. So now if it's a motivation, I can be like, okay, at the end of the week, I need to have all the green skin done. Then I can just forget about it. Oh, for so a bit. you can kind of like plan quite specifically how long stuff's going to take. Yeah. I guess you know before you go into it as well whether it's like viable to get it done in a certain Exactly. Time it's, how, it's how it planned as well for warrior jobs. I mean, did I stick to it? Absolutely not. But it was still there. And <laughs> yeah. it was uh... it's a good starting point as a guide though, isn't it? Because if you if you're going into a project for like the first time and you haven't done yeah. that and you go, okay, I'm going to spend today just blocking in the brown leather and then by tomorrow I'll be onto the helmets, whatever. Yeah, and then you exactly. don't do that. I guess you could have known that going in and planned more accordingly. Yeah, you know, the brown leather on an orc takes 10 minutes and yeah. then you've got, okay, 100 models, that's going to take whatever. And you know that that's, if, if I've got three days to spend that time on it, I can do that. And then I, I've, I've set myself, it's, it's these micro goals, yeah. which you then get that satisfaction of completing something. And for me, that's, that's my motivation. Like if I feel like I've accomplished something that day, I feel like I can, I can just rest. Like I can be like, job done. It, it, and, it gives you that, 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 that hit of dopamine victory that yes. you need to then spur you on for the next day. And yeah. cause you're doing, I guess, cause you know all of the steps in advance, you've got a lot of box ticking satisfaction. That it's you can so do it all the way. Yeah. There's the, yeah. um, have you used the brush rage app by Hendarian? I have. I've heard of it. I'm, I'm aware yeah. of it. I've not tried it. I, it, I've only recently started using it, but it's very good for that. Like, I think it's, it's good for like paint collection as well, but for, for blocking out you, cause you can have like, for instance, I had bone. And then you can do all the steps of the bone. So you can do like the space layer, the shading, the highlighting, and all of that. And then you can just collapse it and have a tick next to it. And you've got bones done. And all those steps are like segmented with different times next to it. Yeah, that's really cool. It's really handy. Yeah. If I find it, it's the best tool for me for motivation. Amazing. I, 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 I mentioned about breaking the back on the project. And I think what I mean by that is getting it to the point where you, it helps you see the, the, the finish line a bit more. Um, I, I've been collecting, I'll explain obviously you're using like the, the normal case study, which is a blood angels. I've been collecting them for the 20 plus years. And one of the things I struggled with was having a, con a consistent force of everything being, it all obviously be the same color as in armor color, but there'd be loads of things at different points, different things, et cetera. And the issue- Funny enough, that, over the course of 20 years, your <laughs> painting changes a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, but- uh, the way I would always approach projects now is is that it's very similar to what you said, Ben, about the micro goals. But I I use the stages of the project as those micro goals. So, so painting the way you said about oh I have to spend three days doing leather or that that's that works perfectly. It's a really good way of giving you those ticks every time you get, achieve that that result or that goal. What I mean is, if you go out and buy an army and you're starting a brand new army and you obviously go grey eyed and buy all the grey shame you could possibly imagine. Who would do that? <laughs> I don't recommend it at all. Um, uh, I, I, would, I would massively advocate that you build everything, no matter what your process is about doing bases, get it all based. Get, I would get, get all of that done so that, and I always say this, your return point when you start something new for the army is a lot closer to the end than unshrink wrapping a box, going through the build, going through the clean, Going through the base, putting the basic material on, going through the undercoat, going through the the the, the prime or et cetera, or, or the main color getting on. If you literally work the whole project, like that, you think the span of a project. If you move from if your starting point and your finish point, and if if your return point every time is slightly closer to the end, you get more motivated to get to the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so what you're saying is like when you pick up the next model from the next squad because it's not shrink wrapped in a box and it's already got the base coats on because you've done it with everything else. Yeah. It's not like you're going back to square one. Correct. You're going back to step six. Good, but a lot of people go, oh yeah, but I've got to sit there building for three days or four days and build the whole army or sp spend a week building it. But I promise you, you're going to use way less time that again, you don't get that back if you just focus. And obviously we I always say this, like as, 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 as creatures, repetition is the mother of success with us. We do something once we, is the, the first time we do something is the slowest, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 12th, 500th time you do it, it's going to be quicker factually because of muscle memory, doing it again and again and again. So if you're in the mindset of building and cleaning, build and clean everything because it mitigates the errors you make. It, it gives you more consistency because your, your hand gets used to where the mold lines are on those kits, et cetera. Like you just get better and more consistent as you repeat that task over and over again. So 
and, and even if you if you're sitting there thinking yeah but i prefer building one unit get done you've still got to spend that time whenever you choose to spend it doing it but i guarantee you you'll spend extra time getting all your cleaning tools out getting your phone yeah, out for sure. getting i think but, that depends on what your um what your goal of that is though so as a bit of a real world example here which is a bit contradictory to the point you've just made no, that's fine so with my blood angels i was very unsure whether to go out and buy like a whole army's worth and build it all and spray it on do it on that way I'd decided pretty early on that, well, I changed my mind, but I had decided early on, I wanted to paint them to a nice high level. It was never going to be like tabletop. It was always going to be very, very nice and high. It has been granted, pushed a bit beyond what I'd originally planned. But regardless, I think I would have still made this choice uh, either way. I, I made the choice of I'm going to do this as a slow growing project. So I, rather than going out and buying like a massive army and overwhelming myself, I went out and bought three Space Marine boxes that I thought were really, really cool. First one being the Stern Guard. I built only the Stern Guard, painted only the Stern Guard to completion, and then they're done. And then now, like you said, I've got to go back to square one. Mm. Upside being, one, I'm painting it in a bit of a different mindset. I've not got a like a time frame that I need this army done. I'm not going to play them for games. This is going to take like 10 years, let's be honest. <laughs> but Generous. I've had to... The downside is though, I'm now going to start my next box this week and I've realized because there's a lot of mixes and stuff that I've used in my painting process, I'm now thinking about how am I going to get these base coated and sprayed and have them look exactly the same. Which is, which is exactly why I was saying, if you see the goal as moving the whole project closer to completion and fruition, that's what's going to help you. And when you combine that process with having a journal and writing in it your process from the beginning so that you've got an anchor point at the beginning of all the choices you're making and then as you move the whole thing forward that 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 entry in your in your journal for project planning moves forward with it if that makes sense yeah like it just it helps give you that that better start point every time you come back to something new which i think is really important um you, the, exactly the point you said like if you're using straight colors you're using straight colors that's fine it's there's less risk of things not looking the same but if you do make loads of mixes or if you're it, it, i say this not not jokingly at all i've picked paints off the rack before six months apart and oh the, completely the, different the, the hue has slightly been different i've run yeah. out of a paint so uh, this is another thing which it's not directly linked to mindset but it does help like and i know i'm sort of like scattergunning the question about mind about motivation a little bit but but if i'm going to do an army when i buy the paint for that army i don't just buy one part of it I will go on the rack and I'll pick five or six of them. Really? Yeah. Oh, he's oh nuts with paint. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This isn't even a joke. He's insane. <laughs> it's mad. Well, hear me out when I say this. So, so because I've had, I'll t I'll, this is a perfect example from my Catachan. So my Catachan, the Catachans involve uh, Kiss Their Flesh, Cadian Flesh Tone and Flayed One Flesh for, for like, and Bugmans. All right. Okay. When I bought a couple, my first pot of Bugmans that I used as the first shadow color for the skin, I bought one, used it on 60 of the, of the cardsmen. I went and bought another pot. It's different color slightly. So now all my shadow color looks different. So when I buy the paint, what I do is I literally get four, four a couple of them. Five, six is a bit much, I'll be honest. But you get get a few of them and obviously just check that the, the, they're all the same. I know it sounds really silly, but you do different, do get different batches of paint. There are there are slight chemical Un imbalances. Unfortunately, we have seen as well paint brands just deciding they do. out of nowhere, oh, should we... You know that paint we've been making for 20 years? Should we change the formula? Should we yeah. change this paint completely? I think everyone would Agrax like that. Agrax and Nolnall, didn't they? Yeah. Like yeah. They completely changed the formula yeah. for launches. Yeah. Well, James, whereas what James will do is he'll go, oh, they're changing that paint range. Hang on. On the phone to his local local Element. hobby store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just run down there. Oh, I'm just going to buy up all of your stock of this paint. And that's how you end up with, how many how many paints do you reckon you've got? Go on, don't lowball me. Don't lowball me. I'm not going to comment. No, go on. No, go on for I, real. I think it's over five or six hundred maybe i don't know a hundred oh i bet it's over a thousand no i don't we'd have to we'd have to do a count up. it's <laughs> got to be over a thousand James. It's, it's probably over a thousand <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but i mean i mean this sincerely like you know these those little things it's not so much linked to motivation but what it is linked to is um is that uh it's linked to the fact that i i just want everything in place so that my focus and attention can be on the project rather than, oh, I've got to get another pot of that. Is it going to be the same color? Oh, I've got to go right back to the beginning and start again. Do I remember the colors I've used? Like, that's my personal opinion and personal approach to it. There's all manners of, of approach to completing an army and getting through it. But for motivation, I just, I just think that every time I start something new for that army, if it's closer to the end point, I'm like, well, I've only got to do, if all of it's primed with the main color, say red or blue or whatever, you know, 
it, that just means that I can go back to it and I know that I've just got to do less steps to get it to match the rest that I've painted. You haven't got to just start again. Yeah, exactly. Which, yeah. 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 We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Seed Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios. Um, so I'm curious, we've spoken about building a little bit there. Um, I'm curious from you, Ben, what is your, I guess, say you're starting an army project from scratch. Have you got any like tricks or ways you like to approach like army building? Cause I think that's something that I've always said gets overlooked a lot. Like there's a billion and one videos on YouTube on how to speed paint your army in a thousand different ways and a thousand different color schemes and a thousand different styles. But you don't really hear much about like efficiency hacks for army building. Do you mean like the construction of yeah, the models? Like literally yeah, literally putting the kits together, getting them off the sprues. Oh, this is... Because it, 120 my... orcs, I'm thinking... I've, I, so I've done a orc cult of speed army, I want to say a year and a half ago for year Siege. And a half ago, yeah. And that had a modest 28 bikes in it. <laughs> They're miserable to put together. Which are, <laughs> that aside... <laughs> Just having that stack, because they come in boxes of three. Yeah. So just having that stack of like, was it like eight boxes or whatever it is, was uh, daunting in its own way. And I thought like, that was the first time I'd ever thought like, can you batch build models? Because that's not really something I'd even consider. Because normally when you're doing an army, at most you might have like three boxes of the same thing. But some armies lend themselves more, like horde armies, something like, you know, Tyrannus, Gene Steelers, that sort of stuff. There's gonna, quite a few armies that I've got less experience with where you've got like a dozen or so boxes of the same thing. So I draw the Orc Boys as an example of that. You've done 120. So was it, it was 90 boys, boys and it was, was it 30 Beast Snagger Boys? Yeah. yeah. So what was your approach? Well, I guess you get that delivery and you see the, the crate of boxes. What, where do you even start with that? I, I, I think it's, you absolutely can badge build it. And I think the, um, I, I would very much recommend it in kind of the similar way James was saying without starting again, because there is a lot of time that is spent looking at the book and then finding that piece on the sprue. Mm. If you're batch building, you after the first five, you know exactly where everything is. So you can do all the legs, then you can do all the bodies, you can do all of that. And especially when you've got um, really complex kits, like like there's some towel kits, which are really complex, where there's loads of little bits all over like different sprues. Um, if you know where everything is, you save so much time. Mm. So, so do you like, time. would you approach it as like step one of the instructions, let's do it for every single yep. box, and yep. then go through them one by one? Yeah. Yeah, that's commitment, isn't you it? You've got to treat that as, as... I guess you learn where, like, the mold lines and stuff exactly, are as well, don't exactly, you? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you learn yeah. where everything is, like repetition. Is. So this is an old one. I'll pull it out of the bag. But, like, when I when I done Lawrence's original Ultramarine Army for TT, I had, I think it was either 9 or 12 drop pods. I literally cut all them off the sprue into piles of the components. And I just had one... Factory. I had one... Well, yeah. Your I, kitchen I, became the drop pod factory. Yeah, yeah it was like my, <laughs> my flat floor literally just became a production line, like a car factory for making drop pods. So I, I, I swear they were Did gonna, you like put yourself in this sort of ad mech, you know, look, are you getting into the character? Well, I was contemplating writing a letter to GW to get my flat registered as an official forge world. <laughs> so, like, so like, it was like... It was like um, you do like the voices in your head. <laughs> you're like a little tech face. You're like stamping them out. Yeah. Like... I literally cut all the pilots out for the drop pod, like all nine or 50, I can't remember what it was, it was a crazy amount. And 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 literally, just, and, and just went through with one set of instructions and I just done the same step times nine, times 12, and then just built them all. Yeah, I, I think that will work really well on drop pods. I I not don't in, do that with infantry. In, not infantry, yeah. <laughs> You'd yeah. lose everything. Well, the thing <laughs> is, you say that, you say that, the, the, the current, or let's say current, the new kits that are kind of like half, mm. half easy, like, well, like easy. Multi-part, multi yeah. monopose, multi-part you've got like half a face attached to the torso. Yeah, that's, yeah. that makes well, it. I think it's more common now that the legs and the torso are one fixed pose. Yeah. And then you can do what you want with the arms and the head and some bits, the, customization bits. The, Generally the rule, right? Yeah. The old Marines were amazing for doing it in that way that I, I said, because literally 
the ball and ball, the leg on the ball on top of the legs and the torso with the socket they used to make building so much easier for Marines because you literally just cut all the legs out, stick all the legs to bases, cut the front and back of the torso, stick those all together. That's exactly how the orcs went. And, yeah. and you literally just work that way. Now, when you've got like certain parts of the of the marine attached to the body that go on the leg, like it just it becomes a bit more convoluted. And then you do like you know I've the difference between building. OG into uh, OG tactical marines and 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 intercessors is like leagues apart. Like the fact that the models are easier because they have less parts or the things actually makes the build and batching in large amounts harder because a certain front plate will only go with a certain set of legs. If that makes yeah. sense. So, do you have any little like motivation tricks for your building stage? Because I think when I've whenever I've done an army, I've massively underestimated how long putting the whole thing together would take. And you mentioned how you like. I'm, I'm not expecting you to time build stages, but do you have any kind of like idea for how long things will take or like any ways that you keep that organized? For building, no. Building's I, hard, right? Building is really hard. And sometimes it's just a shave in the mold lines can take so long. And that I don't, I think it's really hard to to plan for that. Um, and I, I think there, while well, you get a big return on painting with timing each step, I just don't think the return is there for building. I think you've just got to crack on. Building's funny as well, because I think regardless of what level you're painting to, a model is kind of in this binary state of like it's built and cleaned or it isn't. If you yeah, know what I mean. Yeah. Like don't get me wrong, you can go mad like gap filling stuff. But if you put a model together nicely and it's like a new kit and then you clean it, like I feel like regardless of how going into a project, if you know you're only doing it for tabletop or if you know you're going to paint it for like Golden Demon, your build process, other than like maybe choosing to do sub assemblies or not, it kind of feels like the building and cleaning is identical regardless. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, like I, th I think you, you can quick build stuff, like, and you, you know, well, it depends uh, on your standards, I suppose. Yeah, but. there is that as well. And you, you can like, you can build stuff, and you can maybe not shave every like little nub off or every because, like, sometimes I do that where I'm shaving nubs, and I realize, but like, this isn't, this is yeah. going to be inside the model. I, this doesn't well, matter. So, do you? Um, what, what's your sort of stance on sub assemblies and things like that? Then I, I'm, I'm a bit weird. I don't sub assemble unless Ooh, controversial. Yeah, I, I will do heads that are on like bare heads. Hmm. I will sub assemble, um, and I will do stuff that's like. Here's a good example. The Plague Burst Crawler mm -hmm. has these like spikes that run along I know each one. track. Yeah. And they usually want to be picked out with like a metal. I can I'll leave those off because I could just spray those. Spray right. brush yeah. 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 And yeah. it saves you so much time going then going in with the brush. Um I guess if you're someone who uses the airbrush a lot, I guess you're kind of thinking of sub assemblies rather than what's going to give me access. It's like what can I spray a different colour separately and rather than masking. I guess. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Some masking sometimes works, and sometimes you get in there with an airbrush. Anyway, I think I was spraying gnome knee pads, which are about like three <laughs> millimeters. Yeah. So you can, you can still get there with an airbrush. Um. But yeah, it's it's just more like really things that would be really annoying to brush paint, mm. and I could just spray. Mm. That's usually what I leave off. How do you find that this no sub assembly thing impacts the painting? Then do you I, find I find it speeds up tenfold. Really, I, I feel it. You sacrifice a little bit of control and neatness sometimes, and you like there may be some regrets where I'm having to be uh, like I oversprayed with an airbrush or like I accidentally painted like you know my brush brushed past a head that yeah. I've meticulously painted. Well, typically if you're doing like especially if you're doing blends and stuff, it's quite hard to clean up oversprays, isn't it? With yes, the airbrush. it is. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it, it's just it's just more of a thing where it's a bit of a gamble that the the time I would spend painting something in a sub-assembly and like moving things around and having all the bits separate. And then, I don't know. I, I just like having everything complete, not lost. And I can pick up a model, do a bit on the model and put it down. Yeah. And I don't have to think about, okay, head's there, pouch is there. I suppose that's difficult as well when you've got really big projects. Like if you'd done those 120 orc boys and you'd had all the arms and stuff separate, like trying to keep track of who goes with who. And it's just really annoying like... to hold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So interestingly then, how does basing come into that? Because me and James have spoken about this a little bit before and we spoke about it a couple of episodes ago. I am a fan of doing bases entirely separately because I can spray them all separately and such. James is a fan of putting on basing material before he even primes the model so that everything can be done in one go. Mm -hmm. I'm a recent, within the last year, convert from you, uh, George, to James. Oh, I, I, would, I, lost one. <laughs> I would always do basing separately. Now I am a... Put the model on the base, then you can add sculpting material to get it to fit when it's not posing properly. You can add all these. You just have so much more control. It doesn't look like it's hovering on the base. It's, yeah, yeah. I, that, that's one of the biggest things that I, that I, that I dislike about about doing. The I'm so itself. sorry. I'm so surprised by that. As, as yeah. someone who like batch paints a lot and airbrush paints a lot, I know you said you don't like doing sub assembly, so I, I guess that kind of makes sense for this. 
but I'm very surprised that you'd want to sacrifice spraying like 150 bases in one go in like two minutes. Uh, I could get in there with the airbrush. Yeah, but you're still, yeah, but you're, the thing oh, so you're, you're still airbrushed the base I material. airbrushed the base, everything. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. How do you avoid getting it on the feet? Careful, just be careful. Aim. Just get good. <laughs> yeah, get good. <laughs> I, I, I may be the DeWalt sniper, but Ben is the airbrush, the airbrush sniper. sniper. <laughs> <laughs> a water assassin. Yeah. 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 But, um, but the, th the thing is, is like I, I completely synergize with what Ben's saying because the bases become a separate production line and then the whole project essentially has two paths rather than one. Like and and I'd rather have the be careful and neat at the beginning with getting the PVA on and getting the basic material on and then painting around the painting around the feet carefully. I think that's a less investment of time than doing a whole entire base thing. Have you timed it? You're someone who likes to time things. Have you timed it? I, I actually haven't. Okay. I'm probably, it, probably yeah, trying to win in rounds. Trying to win in rounds. It's not even that, right? It's I've done both, and. I, I I never understood like when you make these arguments on the podcast they sound perfectly rational obviously it works because you do it and you wouldn't be doing it right but I still can't get my head around how that's possible maybe just the way I paint but like I have done the basing together before specifically with an Empress Children Army that I'd done and that was the biggest pain of the whole army was doing the basing I found really really frustrating but maybe I'll have to try it again maybe as I've evolved as a painter I need to give it another go it's less stressful yeah, doing it I your agree. way for sure like uh, and there are times where I have just gone in with the and or, or it's really annoying with some materials like crackle paste. Yeah, if the, you accidentally get that on a foot, yeah, you're just like yeah. oh now it's yeah. just like sinking in. It just looks really bad. Um, that's why I'm old school. I use sand. None of this paste. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of PVA. Scour the base. PVA. Sand. Second layer of PVA. Fifty fifty of water. Job done. When I you think... advised about making that custom blend, it's changed my life. Oh, honestly, really? Yeah, the yeah. custom sand blend. I now have a little hobby zone drawer. Yeah, just grab that. One he got me on that earlier. Honestly, yeah. like it's so much fun making the vent. You can go. Here's my seventy six vintage with a bit of brick in it. Here's my <laughs> here's, here's, here's my here's, here's my seventy four vintage with some slate chip. Like yeah, it's, my neighbor's driveway gravel. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the, the uh, borrowed borrowed <laughs> slate. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, like I I I just I love having that. It just gives you that really lovely draw through that's random as well. So yeah, it is fun. But um, but yeah, like. I don't know, like whether, whatever your process, whatever you choose to do in regards to sort of like bases, I, I I understand totally why doing it as a separate process makes sense because then you don't have to worry about being neat around the feet. And you it's just, it's uh, not that. I, like, I get don't, that. Don't get me wrong, I'm stubborn. But it's not, even, it's not even my lack of wanting to change. It's that I just, I think maybe I put more value in the fact that I can, say you've got a rattle can mm. and I've got literally like 70, 80 bases. And what does that take to spray them all when they're on the big bit of cardboard? Like literally like a minute and a half. I think you've got a big win in time there. There's you, no argument. You but you, I, you do start to claw some of it back you lose, when you're putting the models yeah. on and then you're doing the bits around the feet. Oh, yeah. You, you then lose you're, way more when you're drilling into the base oh, paper and, and then you're paper clipping it, then you're gluing it on. Oh, hang on. I've put too much super glue on that one. It's frosted on the foot. Yeah. I've got to repaint the whole leg. Like, I, I, I understand the. The process of doing all 80 in one go is quicker. Factually, that is. I'm not going to argue that. It'd be ludicrous to you. Attaching them to the bases is where you'll hemorrhage more time, in my opinion. Yeah, so, perhaps. Perhaps. It does depend on the basing mix as well. Because I've, had, I've definitely had different yeah. results depending on that yeah. situation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah, so you mentioned the building as well. Big time saver is, <laughs> going back to a previous podcast you had of drilling barrels. Yep. Um, <laughs> oh, God, here we go. That can take a long time. But I did bring a little, little, little gift. Well, oh my it's, god! It's mine. It's not a gift, but I'm going to want it back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, here you go. So is, here is, is this this is the wow stick? Yeah. This is what everyone has been going the on. The best us. of both worlds of a pin vice and a, a Bosch. God, look at the look at the RPM <laughs> on that, <laughs> and look at how much it wobbles. Yeah, that's that does wobble quite a lot. I mean, I don't know, uh, George. It looked like your barrels if I was using this. I was just saying, like, um, uh, Hang on a minute, my barrels came out cleaner than yours. We agreed. They were off center. That's all that matters. Um, yeah, I mean. I don't know if that, that that noise is quite quite piercing, isn't it? It's, it's not, not as the bad worst. as the squeaking. Yeah, it's I not mean, as bad as the squeaking. It's quite cool actually. Like, I, like it's lighter than I thought it was. That's so, how I got through 120 orcs. Yeah, I mean, no, it, no, 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 have you tried? Have you so have you tried a full beans electric drill as well, or are you just coming from the pin vice? I haven't tried the Bosch. Yet. So I, I've I've actually you're, you're a sensible, rational person exactly. that looked at a Bosch drill yeah. and went, you know what, <laughs> that might be a bit much. My hobby desk is not the place right. for power tools. Hang on a sec. All right. Let me so, see, let me see. so I actually had a student on a class this oh, weekend um, actually bring me bring me one of those to talk about it because he was like, I've seen the episode. I saw the drill off, you know, 
it was on my side, George, just going to throw that in there. Um, uh, so yeah, so I actually, um, I actually had uh, a student that, um, that, that brought me that. And, you know, I've actually learned something about that as a, as a tool. Apparently the drill bits are specific to the wow stick. They're not just regular drill bits that you can put in. Is that correct? Correct. So they come with like a set yeah. and they're rubbish and yeah. I've broken most of them. Oh, I think that's see, one of my last See, ones. that's the bummer because with the pin vice, granted my pin vice sucks, but the drill bits I buy, yeah. I buy like, because the cheap, I don't think you, I never realized for the longest time what massive difference the drill bit itself makes and how much they massively vary in quality. Because I'd assumed I'm not drilling through concrete or steel. I don't need the best drill bit in the world. But if anything, it's the opposite because you want it to cut cleanly through the plastic in the same way that I like to use a fresh scalpel blade. You want it to cut through nicely. So I always went for like the high quality drill bits. Yeah. That is a that is a drawback. I'm not going to I have seen, you can get, uh, like I, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but I have seen drill bits that you can buy with those dimensions. That's, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm going to end up doing when this one breaks, which is my so, last one. Am I correct? So the drill bit is, so this whole thicker bit at the bottom is what goes into it yeah so correct? i mean i can yeah. take, take yeah. it out so, so that's what that's the thing then so maybe what happens is that not. all of the no, it's okay. Clammy all, hands all, all the of heat. the all yeah. of the when you tighten it it tightens its maximum tightness is around the, that 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 bottom part i take yeah. it it's so got it won't, it's got a, so it won't yeah. go any tighter it won't go any smaller than this no right, no it's got a collet yeah. so it looks yeah. kind of like a dremel yeah so yeah. you've got like a, a sort of shaft it's like, it, well it's a lot like a pin vice actually it is it's a pin vice yeah i mean i understand why that's like business wise i understand why that's been done so that when you want to buy new drill bits you have to buy it directly from the company I get that totally. That, yeah. that makes sense. It's a shame sense. that they're not sharp though, isn't it? That's a bit of a yeah, sharp body with the drill bit. So you said that they're not the best quality or is it just because they oh. snap? Or? No, it's just because they're brittle. Really? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, they feel really brittle. Like, I mean, it took going through like um, like the plastic bases or 3D printed resin or something. It's just like, yeah, that really does a number on them. But yeah. It, it, it's, I mean, I've heard, I've, I have had a good long conversation about this over the weekend and like that it's got good talk on it. I'm not, oh, yeah, not talk about that's not like a car or anything, but like, <laughs> You know, it's got 500 talk. No, it's, uh, not, it's it, no Bosch drill. It's no Bosch yeah. drill. No, I, I'll tell you where. So I, I got asked a few times by different people about this, but the drill actually started with, with because I used to do a lot of metal models. Mm. And using the pin vice on metal models. Oh, that makes sense. It, yeah. It's like, it's like you get a serious workout, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, doing it. And, and that's kind of where the drill came from, like initially. And the, the, but the thing is, once I never you, thought about that. Yeah. Cause you've grown up on the metal models. Correct. Yeah. So, so when you've been drilling, when you've been pin vicing metal for a long time, you, Switching to an electric drill is like night and day. And then you get a second second peak where you then put that drill into plastic and you're like, holy cow. Like So that's kind of like where, where it kind of came from. The thing from. is, though, I've done the opposite. I started with the electric drill and went, this is far too unwieldy. You, I should buy a pin vice because this is mental. You tapped out I went, too oh, early. I've got a big army project to do. Because when I first started drilling barrels, I was like, well, I don't have a pin vice, but I've got a one mil drill bit from my Dremel. I guess I could put that in my DeWalt that, you know, I used to hang pictures up. And then after three or four of, you know, bolt of barrels, I torn through. I went, you know what? This probably isn't the tool for the job. I should buy a pin vice. See, you just admitted it. You tapped out too early before you got the muscle memory. <laughs> so, so I was only three or four hundred three, torn yeah. up bolters away from becoming a DeWalt sniper. Exa exactly. There you go. No, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, I've, uh, it's, I'm glad you brought it because it's been good to have a look at one in a not sort of pressurized environment of a class. But like, yeah, it, it, um, it, it's an interesting tool. I, I think the one thing for me that is interesting is obviously you hold it very much like a paintbrush or a pen, et cetera. Um, because I am um, a, 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 a man of several years vintage, let's put it that way. Um, and I've got a fair number of years on you in the sense of age. Um, I, because I've done a lot of DIY, using, using a drill for me when I'm drilling something feels, no, just feels more natural. So it, I... I think You're going it, to put up a picture like oh, this bolt is massive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, using that would, I think, will feel odd for me because it feels more like a pen or a, or like a paintbrush. Weirdly, actually, if I can grab that, yeah, yeah, sure. I actually feel like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna nitpick, I feel like ergonomically the the button is kind of in the wrong place. Not I feel lie. like I want to grab it here, yeah, it like cramps, a paintbrush, it cramps yeah. up a bit, and then the button's kind of in the wrong place. So I feel like I kind of have to grab it like this. It, yeah. Yeah, I use um airbrush. Do you use like? Yeah, like this, so you're using it. that. Yeah, so yeah, it's like, instinctively, I wanted yeah. to use my thumb, but I realized I've got to grab it too far away. So yeah, I guess no, the, I the, the airbrush the... finger. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems a cool product. I think I totally understand why the company have put made their own drill bits for it, because then then obviously you have to use their drill bits. That makes perfect sense. Um, but um, but Bit yeah. Bit of a kick in the teeth, though. But quite yeah, I think you can get them. I think yeah. you yeah. can get some knockoff ones. Yeah, yeah, knockoff yeah. Off a... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it, I, it's, it's not going to change me from, from Barry the Bosch. Sorry, that's all right. Yeah, Barry's well, Barry, you're safe. 
You tried, um, Ben. I, I, uh, I admire the effort. Yeah. yeah, it's the power of electricity. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's yeah, it's, yeah, it's closer to the power of electricity. <laughs> it's, I'll tell you what, it's better than that blooming squeaky pin vice <laughs> yeah. you got off Amazon. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I could, I could lie and say I bought a new one. I have not. It hasn't. No. Yeah, no. do you, do you, do, they should sell earmuffs with those with that, with that, yeah, with that pin yeah. voice. Well, I'm yeah. just I'm I'm so miffed that I lost my old one, and like I can't bring myself to buy a new one because I feel like you know that thing where you wait and you wait and you oh, wait because sure. you lost something. You're like, I know that if I order a new one, You'll a new Tamiya it. pin voice, I'll find it before the package even arrives. Just 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 buy Barry's cousin, all right, and get it over and done with. Oh, <laughs> I might I might I was tempted. Well, this is the thing. I was looking at a new pin voice, and I was tempted by the wow stick, but. Maybe that will sway me. I'm not sure. Get a Barry. You'll, sure. be, you'll be out of curiosity. I might, I, might, I might try one. Yeah. yeah. Do it. Do it. If you enjoy listening to these podcast episodes every single week, I'd like to ask that you could please do us one small, tiny favor in return and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your podcast app. It takes only two seconds and it really, really helps us out and it allows us to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the episode. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question you would like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please do leave them in the comments down below on YouTube. Uh, this week we have a question from Admiral Rudy Miniatures who says, what ways has army painting helped your competition painting and vice versa? It's a great question. It's a good question. Um, I think for me, I've, I've not entered dedicated painting competitions of like single figure put it in the display like Golden Demon, that kind of thing. I've not entered that, but I have entered painting competitions at tournaments where you win like best painted and things and won a couple of them. And um, I think for me, it's it's kind of like understanding what, what people are looking for and just focusing on that. So I still paint to a quite a, a efficient manner rather than necessarily display manner, but understanding that what people like is like really bright poppy things that really stand out amongst other things, like maybe focusing on high contrast, like high really picking out maybe um like using whites and yellows that really stand out um so that's something that like i lent towards um but something i definitely look to improve if i was to go into a competition is to just sort of understand where i'm cutting corners in army painting and maybe just approaching that differently you know because mm. the cut corner is always going to be a slightly sloppier job so yeah so i guess you know the corners that you would normally cut from army painting exactly. so you have to specifically think about not it's like you've learned yeah. the things you can cut out if what i'm doing feels like a, yeah if what yeah. i'm doing feels like a bit of a shortcut i might be i might take a step back and think it's like okay how could i spend a bit more time on this make it look a bit neater yeah um maybe do the base separately <laughs> yeah <laughs> Potentially, yeah. yeah. Potentially, I mean, I I I, I totally synergize with that. I I, I think in, in my experience, um, I actually think that painting for competition and when, like, when I've done my squad or when I've done like any of my entries in the past, the planning part of it and like the stage by stage helps you tick off those things whilst focusing on them to get them to their apex and the best you can do them. If that makes sense. Um, so like when it came to the painting, my squad was all red like solidly the brightest red that I was doing at bar edge highlights and stages. And then I just worked through them as if I was batch painting an infantry unit, but the investment of time and attention onto each one in the, in the five, rather than doing 30 or 40 in one batch, I was doing just five. And then I was probably spending equal amount of time that I would do maybe on a batch of 20 or 30 or something like that on that batch of five, just making sure that everything was absolutely seamless. So I don't think, I think the process that I've done armies has directly uh, affected and produced the way that I will do units for like, for like squad category or if I'm doing a diorama or if I'm doing something like that I think it's directly made me do the entries in the same format but just with a greater investment of attention and care as I'm working through each of those colours that I'm putting onto the model um, Interestingly for me ways it's helped my competition painting is actually not really a specific thing but it's just the brush control that i've learned from painting so many models mm. has obviously lent itself to being able to paint competition pieces so i hadn't entered a competition i only entered a competition for the first time last year but i'd probably already painted over a thousand models by then mm. across single figures characters and army projects and i think just from having the reps and just being competent with the brush and being able to execute what it is that i had in my head and what I was aimed to before i put the paint on the model and having that, you know, the brush strokes be what I was intending to do just from that repetition and practice, I think lent itself massively. So like um, you're not you're not really doing anything different. You're just spending the time more focused on one model. Exactly. And using yeah. what you've yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And like you said about like the corner cutting thing, obviously I'm not doing that, but I feel like just having the competency because like a lot of people would be like, oh, well, for example, they might say like, oh, I don't think uh, I'm very good at edge highlighting. Um, that's something I need to practice on. Maybe I need to do that before I enter a competition. Whereas because I've got spent so many hours doing that, that wasn't an issue for me. It was more of a, okay, let's think about the additional stage. I was thinking about more like bigger picture things rather than the actual application of the paint. So I was thinking about like composition, color scheme, recipe, the way I was going to execute things rather than the specifics of like, oh, I'd like to do that, but can I pull it off? It was granted, there's still plenty of improvement that I could make with my brush control and with my techniques and things like that. I'm not saying that at all, but I feel like I was at a bit of an advantage just in that regard. It was a bit of a weight off of my mind, if that makes sense. It was less of a focus than perhaps it would have been. Um, I'm interested actually, they say, and vice versa. So what are some things from competition painting that have translated to army painting? Um, I, I would always recommend anybody to have the mindset of when they're, when they're painting to not their mindset be, oh, this is okay. That will do. That's good enough. That's acceptable. Oh, it's okay. No one will see it. That, that kind of those kind of, that kind of thought process. I think that directly leads to you accepting a lesser quality than what you're capable of on the miniatures. And I think when you apply what I would personally recommend, and in my opinion, which is think to yourself while you're painting, I've got to paint the neatest, sharpest, smoothest, best I can. If you paint, if you apply that to, to obviously your competition entry because you're trying to paint to the best of your ability. But if even if you apply that approach to your army painting, just by thinking that way and making sure that you're you're when you're finishing a section or doing a certain thing, you are okay. Is that the best I can do it to? I still think that you will produce an overall better quality army because the thought process and mindset behind the way you're using the brush is totally different than the oh, okay that'll do. Because you're not really paying full attention or concentration when you're thinking that way. You're just like, oh yeah, I'll just get the silver blocked on, on there. Okay, that'll do. I'll, you know, if I hold it that way, no one can see that. Okay, fine. Like that that acceptance of mediocrity when it comes to your painting is, is I think, one of the direct causes of you looking at it when it's finished and going, oh, I'm not really happy with that. Like if you if you actually apply a thought process and mindset behind the brush of it needs to be sharp, needs to be smooth, needs to be clean, needs to be the best I can, just because it's for gaming, you will get quicker naturally at painting in that in that format, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like the, the first time you paint that way is going to be slowest, factually. But it's the same as batch painting. The first model you paint is going to be your slowest. The 10th, 15th, 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th one is going to be the quick, the quickest one and probably the best, most sharply painted one. So it's not just as well. It's, like, it's not even just about time because like cutting corners you think of as like a quality thing. And it, I think of looking at it as a quality thing and a time thing, they're kind of separate things. So like yeah, yeah. you can paint a model not necessarily to the best of your ability, but you kind of have this default of neatness. So like, for example, with the Siege Commission, we have our different painting levels, bronze, silver, gold within the core. And if I'm going to paint a bronze model, overall, I'm going to spe spend less time on the model because mm. it's, you know, it's a less lower work. standard and it's, and it's not as many highlight stages and such. But when I'm doing those stages, they are as neat yeah, as yeah. if I was to do a gold model, yeah, if correct. that makes sense. Yeah. I don't... I could take a bronze model and then push it up to silver Correct, or push it yeah. up to gold by adding more to it. It's not like I'd have to start from square one and have this like completely fundamental different approach to painting the model. So, and it's nice as well because like you, what you're saying about how oh, like people cut corners, it's nice to have in your own army when they're on the table, it's nice to not be thinking in the back of your head like, I hope he doesn't pick it up. And take it down. <laughs> I, hope it doesn't pick up. I hope he doesn't look behind the, behind the bolter because he'll see that the acrylic wasn't painted. Yeah. No, that, that, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Like, uh, and I think it's that it, it it's you being okay with with that. Like I, I, well, if you're okay with that, that's fine. I mean, obviously, but if, that, if you want to get an army, I mean, I can paint an army pretty quick and do all that stuff and leave yeah. stuff. I don't think there's anything stuff. wrong with that. No. But if you're someone who wants to improve, yeah, and you do want to start thinking about things more critically and how you can get better, then those are some of the things that unfortunately you do need to leave behind. I think. Yeah, hundred percent. I always say it like uh, you know, um, your your comfort zone as a painter. And your complacency of remaining within that comfort zone is your enemy. It is like because you're not going to progress if you don't if you if you just stay. Oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I'll do that. That's fine. Yeah. If, if you if you're not thinking I want this to be better and you're trying to paint it when you're painting, you're not gonna you're not gonna progress yeah. in the quality of what you execute as a painter. So yeah. So yeah. Okay, our closing tradition on the podcast is a segment that we call Hobby Hacks. This is where we share a quick little tip with you you can incorporate into your painting. And as is tradition we ask our guests to bring a little hobby hack to the podcast. Uh, we've dropped, we dropped a few during the episode, obviously, but uh, so we're curious, Ben, what is your hobby hack for this week? This was the hardest thing about prep. When you're just like, okay, here's what we're going to be talking about. Make sure you have a hobby hack. I'm like, 
you've, you've, you've covered everything. I don't think you've covered this, but it is kind of an improvement on what you've previously covered, okay. in my opinion. Okay, yeah, go, yeah, go. Yeah, it leans in towards uh, batch building. I brought another show and tell. Um, <laughs> this know, is great. No, this this is brilliant. Okay, we have a model and we have the power of Where magnetism. Was it? Well, that was, he pulled it out of like his inventory. You know when I you know, go GTA, uh, he's yeah. got a jetpack. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Gets out a tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Traveling with this was nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, so I, I will magnetize all my bases when doing an army project. Right. For multiple reasons, because I think it saves so much time. Okay. There is one reason, which is use the inverse baking tray, stick all your models on that, and they're not going anywhere. And you can spray prime them. You can spray prime 30 at once on a baking tray. And yep. it, it's just fantastic. Um, but also, I think you previously talked about using shot glasses. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you've got a magnet and a, and a shot glass with a magnet on on there, or like a cork, which I use, like these yeah, yeah, Seco yeah. corks, you've now got a rotating painting handle. Oh, that's great. Oh, okay. That's great. Sorry, so when you're painting, this is the, be this yeah. is, this is the best. No, this is great. <laughs> look at him. Look at that's him. great. <laughs> a friction. That's, yeah, there you go. That is brilliant. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Could you, could you hold that a little bit higher for the camera? Yeah, that is absolutely amazing. Like, <laughs> so, you've, so you've just embedded a magnet that's in brilliant. the cork. Just glued a magnet on, yeah. Yeah, if you dig up the, the Well, cork works well because you can dig it up and it gets a really tight and, you could, and like you said, you could still do it on the shot glasses. Yeah, you could. Yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. So I thought I'd upgrade a hobby hack. Right? Yeah, I mean, no, that's brilliant. That's, uh, oh, that's... So I'm sorry to all of our former guests, but this is the winner. <laughs> that that's, that is great. I'm I'm sold 100 on that. That is absolutely brilliant. How have we never come across? I this? don't know. And this works know. really well with armies as well because you, if you have like 20 painting handles, yeah, yeah, and you're not like dealing with blue tack or whatever, yeah, you no, can just snap no, it off, snap it off. This is tremendous. What you, I mean, what you said about the baking that tray, is... you almost like glossed over. I was, my yeah. mind was blown and then you yeah, pulled this you out just, as well. You just like go, again, go, you can go down TK Maxx, buy yourself yeah. a baking tray, okay, yeah. and pick up a wet pallet while you're there. Yeah. And then, and then you're, and then you're, you're sorted. Everything's done. One shop. In and done. I'm, I'm, li I'm not joking. On my way home from the office, I'm literally <laughs> going to go to the shop and get some of these. This is brilliant. That's great. It's brilliant. Why? Uh, yeah. The other thing as well, I'm going to tack something It spins. On. It spins, James. I know, it's great. I'm going to tack something onto this as well. Yeah. So if you've got bigger models, you just double or triple stack the magnet in the core. Yeah, absolutely. And it increases the strength. So you you won't might... get the rotation. Well, but, you, yeah. well, you get a workout on your thumb. Oh, right? yeah, okay. you know, yeah, that's true, yeah. yeah. So, oh, you mean stack one on top of it? Yeah, stack yeah, yeah. one on top inside the cork. So you just drill down deeper, oh, and get, yeah. you, get you to, drill to out. To drop another hobby hack, if yeah. you stack magnets, they do become stronger. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. you literally just, you just double stack them. And um, jobs are good, and, and then you can hold everything. Like, yeah, no, that's, that is brilliant. There you go. Yeah, the, it's the spinning for me. The spinning's yeah. great. And I know there are some hobby handles out there that, that have got the Don't need them. Don't yeah, need so them. I put them all out of business. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. And, and Ben's a man of taste, Prosecco cork. Like, he's not, no, no cheap, cheap budget wine, <laughs> spending the big bucks on the drink, you know, like, it's a uh, five pound uh, of Prosecco. That's great. That's absolutely mega. Brilliant. Well, we're not topping that next week. No. So sorry, everyone. We've peaked here. Uh, <laughs> Hobby Hacks will formally be shutting down. No. No. Uh, I've got a few still in the bank. Don't worry. I, well, they probably won't top that. It's a, a high bar but, now, isn't it? Yeah, that is high. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Ben, no for coming on the show. Uh, we believe that you have a Blood Bowl podcast as well. Would you like to oh, plug yeah, that? Oh, yeah, I can yeah. plug that. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah so list, some listeners may know um, from I'm from the Bonehead podcast. Yep. We um, do talk about all things Blood Bowl. And we're also doing weekly streamed games um, where we've got, kind of got this like viewer interactive league. Um, so if you want to check that out, that'd be cool. Yeah, we'll link that in the description for everyone. Uh, yep. Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. Thank you again for Ben for coming on and we will catch you next week. Bye.